Are we born to cheat? Are we born to do bad stuff? Are we born to exaggerate? Are we born to lie? Or do we have this phenomenal potential at birth that causes us to do great things, that, that causes us to discover God's purpose and plan just naturally? That's a pretty good question. It's like playing ping pong. We go back and forth. We debate the issue. And then finally, you can't resist it. Boom! You smash it. We're going to talk about what it means to debate the subject of cheating. Cheating, specifically in, in the marriage situation. It's interesting to look at all the stats and to see what people say about cheating and to see what people do about cheating. Just the other day, I was thinking about this whole subject matter. As I was preparing for this debate that we did with Nightline Thursday, as I was preparing for it, I was thinking about various situations, various stories that I had come in contact with where people had steps outside the marriage vow, where people had actually hooked up in the wrong bed. I thought about the carnage. I thought about the shame, the guilt. I thought about the fragmented families. I thought about the marriages that had been messed up because of cheating. And I began to ask myself some of these questions, some of the questions that I thought might be posed my way during this debate. Like, does adultery help the marriage? Some people say that. Like, do we, do we have to step out of the relationship and get satisfaction in another bed? Like, did God really mean what he said when he said in the seventh commandment, don't commit adultery? I mean, did God really say that? Yeah, that was a, that was a long time ago, several thousands of years ago, but, but, but is that really relevant in today's culture? I was thinking about some of those issues. When the Nightline taping occurred, I walked on stage from that part, and I just cruised over here, and I sat down. And when I sat down, I noticed someone in the crowd that my wife and I have known for a for a good while, and this person, while watching this debate, was in the throes and is in the throes of a horrendous marriage. Her husband is a serial cheater, a serial adulterer, and, and while the whole debate was unfolding, I sort of looked her way and glanced at my wife, and I could tell the emotion. I could tell the whole situation as, as it was unfolding in her life. And then I was, I was shocked when Noel Bitterman, who owns AshleyMadison.com, and his, his uh, friend and, and uh, fellow follower, sort of, uh, Jenny Block, who wrote the book, The Open Marriage, I was, I was interested when they were talking about the fact that there's no real devastation in adultery. There, there's no real repercussions. There's no real fallout or damage in the, in the scenario. They were talking about that on stage while I was watching this woman think about all of the cheating her husband had participated in in the, in the years and years of their marriage. It was a, kind of a surreal situation. It was something that most people who were, were watching the debate had no idea was going on. I see the downside of sin. Yeah, there is an upside to sin. There, there is a, there's a fun side to sin, but I see the downside of it. And if we look at a situation long enough, especially cheating in marriage, we will see that the downside, that, that the consequences of this sin are devastating. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, if you have your Bibles, you might want to turn over there, Proverbs. It says, 
chapter 14, verse 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to destruction. In the end, it leads to death. Question, are we born to cheat? Answer, yes. We're born to cheat. That's just, that's just the way it is. The Bible calls this sin. Some people call it an inherited corruption. No one taught me how to lie, how to steal, how to cheat, how to think in pure thoughts. No one taught me that. I just know how to do it. And if you don't believe we have a sin nature, just crank out a couple of kids and watch them develop. You'll see sin right before your eyes. We have a sin nature. And we receive that nature from Adam, the Bible said. You might be going, Adam? Adam who? I'm talking about Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve had this perfect environment. They fumbled the ball. They decided to do what they wanted to do. And because of it, we've received this sin nature. We've received this, this inherited corruption. So on one hand, we have the sin nature. Are we born to cheat? Yes, we have the sin nature. But on the other hand, we have this unlimited potential for greatness. Because remember, we're made in the image of God. I wanna, I wanna give you something that I call the God grid. And when it comes to today's topic, that we're debating here in church, adultery, I think it is very, very relevant. Also, you can pretty much name any topic, anywhere, any issue that you're debating or anything or any relational situation that you come up against, I believe this grid will, will work in your life and mine. The first thing I wanna write down here is the word content. Say content with me, content. God, and I'm a horrible speller. If you see a misspelled word, don't freak out. Just say, man, that's Ed. He's horribly ADD. God bless him. <laughs> content. God has given us the content. We have the content to live life. We have gifts and abilities and aptitudes. We have, we have things that we can do that no one else can do. God has given that to you and to me. So we got the content. We all have content for greatness. Notice the Bible always not only talks about the content, but also it talks about the context. The text, the Bible, the Word of God, talks about the context, the venue, you might say, the playing field, the court, the area where we live out the contents. Where do we live out our abilities and aptitudes and gifts and, and, and all the stuff that God's given us, the blessings? Where do we live it out? We live it out where? In the context of, for example, marriage, in the context of family, in the context of our career, in the context of money management, God's way. So you might want to write here, this context will be God's venue. When God gives us contents, he always provides a context in which to use these abilities, aptitudes, and gifts. It's, it's a beautiful thing. God made it so obvious for you and for me. Take marriage, for example. God's given us the contents. He's given us the desire for the opposite sex. He's given us the desire for intimacy, the desire for relational harmony, the desire for pleasure, the desire for procreation, the desire to have a family. When we do it God's way, when we live in context, what's gonna happen? We're gonna discover, and, and, and you'll, you'll, you'll love this, our destiny. Wow, God has a destiny for you and me, and if we saw God's destiny, all of us would be like, what? Is that phenomenal? Is that incredible? I can't believe that. We, we, we couldn't even wrap our pea brains around it. God's destiny is that amazing for all of us here. God's destiny. Well, how do we discover God's destiny? We understand that we have contents. I have contents that you don't have. You have contents that I don't have. God's given us the context, where to live it out. His way works. 
I'll say it again, God's way works. We do it God's way, boom, we'll discover our destiny. If we don't do it God's way, what's gonna happen? We will experience destruction. That's what the Bible says, destruction. Wow, is it that simple, Ed? I mean, it just happens that quick. Well, I left something out that I wanna tell you about. And this is, this is so cool because remember, we're made in the image of God. We're not animals, right? God made that very, very obvious in the book of Genesis. You're not dogs in heat. You're not, you're not spawning salmon. You are made in my image, God said. We're different than the animals. But in our culture, we've animalized humans and humanized animals. We're human beings. We're made in the image of God. God is a God who has feelings. God is a God who loves you and me. God is a God of the choice. Isn't that great? God, God chooses to love you and me. God has chosen to make you and me. God has chosen to redeem you and me. So we are creatures of choice. And we have the opportunity to use our brains, to use wisdom, to reason, and to make these decisions. We're not puppets, robots. We have a choice. So right here, if you're writing this down, if you're drawing this, think about choice. We all have the choice. We either choose to live in context with how we're wired, with how we're designed, or not. If we choose to live in context with how we're designed, we'll discover our destiny. When we don't, what's gonna happen? We'll experience destruction. Again, let's go back to the garden, Adam and Eve. What happened? Adam and Eve sinned. Well, before sin entered the human equation, think about the created beings in heaven. Think about the angels. Lucifer was in charge of worship. Lucifer basically said, I want to be God. Lucifer said, I want to sovereignly rule over a universe called me. He tried to kick God off the throne of his life. What happened? Because of that, Lucifer was kicked out of heaven. He fell. He took a third of the angels with him. Now you move to the garden. He takes in the form of a serpent. The Bible said he tempted Adam and Eve. And think about the temptation for a second. The first temptation was over truth. Adam and Eve were managers, not owners. I mean, they had it going on. Everything was perfect. They had the contents. They had the context, the garden. Everything was just flowing. Well, the enemy comes in, and the enemy begins to talk to them about truth. And they begin to ask themselves this question, what is truth? Adam and Eve began to say, maybe God's holding out on me. Maybe he's not giving us the, the, the total package. Maybe I don't know all the 411 about this, about this whole situation. What is true? What is true? Then they begin to ask a second question as the serpent began to tempt them. What's right? I mean, what is morally right? Yeah, God says don't touch the fruit on the tree in the middle of the garden. He said we can have fun with all the other, all the other trees. We can eat off those trees and have a great time and manage everything. But, but don't touch. Don't touch the fruit on the tree, that tree of knowledge. Don't mess around with it. What is right? Maybe, maybe what God says isn't right. Maybe, maybe just maybe there is another way. The third question was the identity question that the serpent began to mess with them over. Who am I? <laughs> they began to go, well, who am I? Am I, am, am I really created in the image of God? Or could I become God? Could I run the show? Could I forge my own future? Could I pave my own path? Could I call the shots for my life? That's what happened in this whole scenario. So because of that, because man chose to rebel against God, we chose to live outside the context of, of what God had provided, what happened? We chose destruction. 
And that's why the scriptures say repeatedly, the payment for sin, the wages of our misbehavior is death. And because of what Adam and Eve did, they, they, they chose to do this, and you would have chosen the same thing, so would I. Destruction, death was the payment. So the first Adam messed up. The first Adam didn't do it. The first Adam pretty much said, okay, I'm gonna play God. I'm gonna be God. I'm gonna run the show. Let me stop here for a second. We've all done that. Every time we sin, Every time we cheat, because we're born to cheat, right? We do that. You say and I say, I know what's better for me than God does. I'm gonna sovereignly rule over a universe called me. I know what's true. I know what's right, because it's right for me. You know, you know it feels good. I wanna, I wanna go with my heart. I know who I am. I can run the show. I'm gifted to, to call all the shots and make all the choices in my life. We do the same thing that Adam did. So the first Adam didn't do it. He didn't make it. And we've received that sin nature from Adam. But God, say but God, but God did something. You know what God did? God chose, and we're made in God's image. We have a choice, right? God chose to send the second Adam. Who's the second Adam? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, what did he do? He had the contents, fully God and fully man. Something that I'll never understand, something that you will never comprehend. We just, we just can't get it. He took on the limitations of the flesh. He lived on planet Earth. Obviously, he was blessed Yet he was tempted and tried and tested in ways that we will never, ever, ever be tempted, tried and tested. So when we come to Jesus, we have a sympathetic savior. We have someone who's been there. Jesus had all of the contents and he chose, right? He chose to live within the context of the Father's will. And here's the awesome thing. He did it perfectly, righteously. He did it pristinely. He lived this perfect existence. He was righteous. You know what righteous means? People say, oh, that was righteous, dude. That's righteous. Well, Jesus was 100% righteous. And because he chose perfectly within the context, what happened? He discovered his destiny. What was the destiny of Jesus? He lived a sinless life, died a sacrificial death, rose again, and now, because of what the second Adam did for you and me, Jesus Christ, we can have a relationship with him. So watch this now. Are we born to cheat? Yes, but we can be reborn for faithfulness. We can be reborn for our destiny. We can be reborn to have a phenomenal marriage. We can be reborn to have a family that matters. We can be reborn to understand that we're in that career for a reason. We can be reborn to receive blessings and to bless others. That's the beauty of the gospel. Content and context. But you got the content without the context, you got destruction, you got content with the context, you always have the ultimate destiny. I've gotta ask you, how are you using your content? How are you using these gifts and abilities? How are you using these desires? How are you using your, your, your stuff? How are you using it? Because life is short. We have just a short window, and what we do on this side of the grave affects where we will spend eternity. I'm shocked, though, at, at the many, many examples of people that we see day in and day out who are living outside the context. I'm shocked and rocked at how many people are not discovering their destiny, but are on the path to destruction. All you gotta do is flip to the channels, and we see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who were living out of context, who seem to have it all, yet they're on a pathway to 
destruction. They're not discovering their destiny. Chasing after money and fame and pleasure and sensuality and the, and the quick fix. I am God. I'm God. I'm sovereignly ruling over a universe called me. It's nothing new. <laughs> That's old school, man. Read the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon. Solomon had money that Bill Gates can't even fantasize about. Solomon built buildings that Donald Trump could only build in his wildest dreams. Solomon had women like no one. The wisest man who ever walked on planet Earth, Stephen Hawking never had that kind of IQ. Wow, he had it all, didn't he? Solomon. And for 40 years, Solomon took a free for all. He said, you know, I am gonna live out of context. I'm gonna take my contents and do what I wanna do. And Solomon went for it. Read about him in the book of Ecclesiastes. And here's what's so, what's so sobering about his statements. After he had burned up 40 years of doing this and doing that, you know what Solomon said? He said, number one, it's chasing after the wind. That's what Solomon said. All this stuff, it's just vanity. When I was 22 years old, and this is a long story that I won't bore you with, I had an opportunity to sit down and meet with Muhammad Ali for about an hour. And I had the chance to share my faith with this guy. And this is before Parkinson's disease had really ravaged his body and totally messed him up. And Ali was a very engaging person, a very nice person, someone who was willing to listen. Obviously though, he was extremely lonely, bitter, and you could tell he was, he was searching for something. I was with a writer from Sports Illustrator named Gary Smith at the time, and I remember Gary Smith writing about Ali, and he, he penned a quote from Muhammad that I'll never forget. Muhammad Ali said, and I quote, I had the world by the tail, and it ain't nothing. Muhammad Ali, Solomon, out of context. Why is your life screwed up? You're living out of context. Why isn't it working for you in the marriage? You're living out of context. Why isn't the dating relationship really happening? You're living out of context. Why don't you really have a grip on your finances? You're living out of context. Are we born to cheat? Yeah. But we're reborn for faithfulness. We're reborn for our destiny. I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled when we have people in the 30s and 40s here at Fellowship Church commit their lives to Christ. I mean, there's, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like watching someone bow the knee to Jesus and to make that choice because we're not forced to become believers. We make that choice. I love that. There's nothing like that. But I want to see people, I want to see young people at Fellowship Church who say, you know what, Ed? I didn't wait until my 30s and 40s and 50s. I didn't waste decades like Solomon and Muhammad Ali. No, no, I don't want to waste my life. I want to hear young people say, you know what? I became believers at 11 years old at Fellowship Church, and I've lived for Jesus my whole life. That's what I want to hear. And that's why we have our children's ministries. That's why we have our student ministries. That's why we have these camps. That's why we do what we do. I'm tired of people saying, well, I want to sow my wild oats and then pray for a crop failure. I'm sick and tired of hearing that. I talked to too many people who were so lonely and so isolated and so messed up because they're basing their life on relativism. Did you hear Noah Bitterman? Did you hear him? Did you hear Jenny Block? Their whole 
their whole shtick, their whole game was totally self-refuting. They were absolute, and they are absolute, about relativism. That, that doesn't make sense. They're saying there's no absolutes, yet they're absolute about no absolutes. What are they smoking? I'll tell you what they're smoking. They're smoking life out of context. They don't even know it. They're confused and they don't even know they're confused. No one lives by relativism. People say all the time, well, what's true for you is true for you. Who am I to impose my truth on you? Okay. Let's say you live that way. You, so you, so you want to live that way. All right, that's good. That's good. Yo, you're driving home from church. Arr, boom, you get in the car wreck. Oh, man, you broke your knee. Compound fracture, man. Your knee's all messed up. It's just like, oh, it's just horrible. Sticking out of the skin, everything. And they take you to a hospital. And this hospital is a relativism hospital. And, 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 and the surgeons look at you, and there's a team of surgeons, and they're relativists. They go, you know what? I, I, to me, to me... He needs a nose job. His nose is all jacked up, man. This guy, something, yeah, okay. And, and another one goes, well, to me, I, 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 I want to take out his pancreas. Are you kidding me? Do you want chaos and destruction? Go to a hospital. It's all about relativism. Okay, you watch some football. You watch a Cowboys game or a Dolphins game. You order some pizza from Domino's. What if Domino's turned into Domino's, the pizza of relativism? Hey, I want some Domino's. I want a, I want a large pepperoni uh, with extra cheese. All right, we'll have it there in 30 minutes. Three hours later, I want it's Domino's. Man, where have you guys been? Well, I don't know, just, you know, 30 minutes is three hours to me. I mean, 30 minutes is 30 minutes to you. But to me, 30 minutes is three hours. So here's, here's your pizza. You open the box expecting this great pizza, and there's a filet of fish in the box. You're like, this is not pizza. This is fish. But the relativist from Domino's goes, well, it's pizza to me. When you live a life of relativism, you base your life on particulars, and the result is destruction. There is a way that seems right to man, but only ends in destruction. And here we had Noah Bitterman and Jenny again. Jenny, who wrote the book, The Open Marriage. Noah, who has this website, 4.7 million users. He's talking about how to commit adultery, and adultery will help your marriage. You know the woman I told you about who was watching this unfold? You know the woman that Lisa and I know whose marriage has been messed up because her husband is a serial cheater? After the debate, she went home alone. At 11.15, she heard this, a knock at the door. She opened the door and was served with divorce papers. And she texted my wife and I, she said, here is the destruction. The choice is up to you. Destiny or destruction? Content or context? May we live in context so we can discover our destiny. Okay? Let's do it. Let's do it because life is short. Let's do it. Because marriage matters, let's do it. Because our future 
is that bright. It's that amazing. It's that awesome. That's what's in the cards for you and me if we do it God's way.